The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world. In America, the rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Hi, I'm Jason Stein, host of Cars and Culture. Before we get to this week's interview, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. I love the conversations I get to have on this show because they're exactly that. They're conversations. Another podcast I found worth checking out for conversations is Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. Greg Ulan goes deep with guests on everything from used car acquisitions to finding your niche and selling to it. I definitely recommend adding Connected to your rotation. Welcome to Cars and Culture on Sirius XM and episode 122. I'm your host, Jason Stein. Could John Paul DeJoria be the world's most interesting man? He qualifies in more ways than one. His story is the great American dream. Homeless multiple times, down and out more often than he can count, and yet successful and resurgent in a way like few others. And there are a few people on the planet that can exemplify the dynamics of JP. Yet even without the Paul Mitchell salon empire, or the creation of Patron tequila, or the billions of net worth, J.P. DeJoria already rises above most. Put simply, he's the world's most positive man. He's a man filled with pride and purpose and passion. He's all about giving back and doing the right thing for the world and making sure that the world knows how much he wants to give back. And maybe he does that because he knows what it's like to be at rock bottom. DeJoria entered the world of hair care as an entry-level employee of Redken Labs and was fired from his position. A few short years later, he helped form John Paul Mitchell Systems with hairdresser Paul Mitchell and a loan for $700 while living in his 20-year-old Rolls-Royce. But that was only one of two times that JP was homeless and bounced back. That's been his story, continually coming back, regrouping, reinventing, and all the while creating culture at every turn. And on the car side, he's had an enormous impact. He sponsored racing and started his own personal car collection that would rival any collector. Oh, and then there's the tequila empire, built from a chance interaction with a gentleman who put a fine tequila in front of him one day, and the rest was history. But let JP tell his story. It's a remarkable one, an American dream from an American dreamer. Positive, happy, focused, and ever-charging. A legend in business and culture, JP DeJoria. Hi, I'm John Paul DeJoria, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason. Let's go. <laughs> it is wonderful to have you on the program. Perfect for the business channel because you're the great American business tale. Welcome in, John Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about your story. Uh, I think it actually, your story circles back to cars and culture oh, in yeah. so many ways. <laughs> Um, there, there, there are stories that we're going to get into that involve Rolls Royces and, and things of that nature. But I want to go to a description that I read about you. Uh, you were described as an aging hard rocker, but with relentless positivity that's almost Muppet-like. <laughs> it meant in the kindest way. <laughs> nice. and, yeah. jo and, and Josh Tickle, who co-directed the 2016 documentary, Good Fortune, which is, of course, all about you, said at some sure. stage he chose to be unstoppably positive and to be someone who gives of himself and his time. That sounds incredibly accurate, doesn't it? Yeah, my wife is asked that all the time. Is this guy for real? He just seems to be happy and positive all the time. She goes, yep. She says, I doubted it when I first met him, but that was real. And that was 33 years ago. So, no, I am. That's just how I am. And my goal in life, I think, is to get every human being take off their shoulders anything that's holding them down, any regrets, any anything negative, any hate, any anger, any anything off their shoulders. Go, go forth happy. We're here in these particular bodies for just so many years and why not make them happy years happy years i mean if god created someone in his image and let's say we were okay wouldn't he want them to be happy and not sad and fearful and all this other stuff people come up with so that's how i am i, I just am that way and i i want everyone else to be that way it's okay to be happy it's okay to be kind it's okay to be positive your life just gets much better when it does you have so many sayings that i'm going to refer to during the course of our conversation today but one of them is is really change, create, inspire. Dreams really do work. 
And related to that, a success unshared is a failure, isn't it, John Paul? That is so correct, sir. I've been homeless twice. Even when I started Paul Mitchell, I ended up in the car because everything went wrong with no money. But uh, no, it is. And by the way, it's contagious also. If you have a positive attitude and you're enthusiastic, it's very, very, very contagious. And it's something that is very, very good for you because no matter where you're at, if you look at where you're at right now, no matter where it is, even if you're really down, like I was really down and out, I had a young kid, I was homeless, all that. So all I thought about is now, now where am I going to sleep? Where am I going to eat? Things couldn't get any worse. They could only get better. And they have a little different attitude on life. It, it really does, um, I, I guess, set a mindset forward. But you also created an ethic to some extent. And you said when you start with next to nothing, all you've got is a lot of thought, a lot of innovation, figuring new ways to do things without using a lot of money. That's probably where that ethos came from, right? You betcha. would be very, very happy to. Realizing that, yeah, everyone gets down. Things happen. But when you open yourself up to getting off your shoulder, very important, any regret, any pain, anyone you hate, anything you don't like, just get it all off your shoulders, period. Then you have a clear mind. Normally, when people are down and out, I know I was there. You think about, oh, my God, things are so bad. I wish I didn't do this. I wish I'd do that. It's so-and-so's fault. Everything that you can think about. Well, it's not going to change yesterday's newspapers because you can't change them, right? Well, if you realize that and forgive it, forgive yourself for the past. Okay, I made a mistake here. I should have done it this way, but it just didn't happen, okay? Well, that's behind me. I can't change it. So-and-so was mean to me. So-and-so stole all my money. So-and-so lied to me. Forgive them to yourself. I forgive you. You're a jerk. I forgive myself for doing the wrong things. Now that's behind me. I can't change it. If it ends up in your mind again, you go, hey, that was yesterday's newspaper. Remember, get out of here. You have a clear mind to think ahead. When you have a clear mind, you look at a lot of the positive things coming and you just get rid of the negative. I tell people there's two things for success in anything you do, especially your own life. One of them is be prepared for rejection in your personal life or business life. It's going to happen. If you know it's going to happen and you're prepared for it, what it happens is, oh, that's trivia. Of course, JP had said in my life, many things will happen where there's rejection, but it's not going to affect me because I'm going to do what the other people that are not successful people don't do. I'm going to move ahead with a positive mental attitude. The second thing is make sure your product, your service you're selling or yourself that you're selling to someone else is the best there is. You never want to be in the selling business, even for yourself. You want to be in the reorder business where people like you and what you're doing so much, they want to see you again. It changed your life. It makes you happy. And one little last thing I want to throw in here, I have to. The greatest high you will ever get in your life, the greatest high, even higher than being on the starting line of top fuel funny cars going whoa, 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 and flying in the ground shake, even higher than that is whenever you do something for somebody else and ask absolutely nothing in return, not for a piece of the action, not even a thank you, you get the greatest tie you'll ever get in your life. And I know what it's like to get high. I was a child of the 60s and nothing you could smoke today could get you as high as you would be doing something for someone else asking nothing in return. Did you always <laughs> did you always look at life this way? Uh, I mean, well, there were my my weird days in my early twenties. I did a lot of things I regret. I can't change them, so I don't regret them anymore. It's a past. Right. Yeah, so let's say there were a few years of my life. It wasn't quite like this, you know. I was misguided, but but I I popped on back to me. Now, with your focus being on 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 all things, uh, I. I would say uh, a variety of interest, a huge variety of interest. Where do you get the most high today? Is it is it from those philanthropic efforts? I'm guessing no, that. the majority of my life is spent around philanthropic things, whether I'm doing it on behalf of a company, an investment, or just because it's the things to do. That's number one. But I'm still chairman of the board of John Paul Mitchell Systems. And of course, with Bandero, I'm you know, the number one advisor getting that product out all over the place, as well as you know, working in some other areas, which are really, really exciting. There's some various things with a group called Rocket that we're putting out right now. And so I'm looking at various things. I'm also in the medical profession now to find new solutions with vitamins to cure challenges people have had from the past. So I'm pretty well diversified out there, but in a fun way. But in cars, I'm still in cars. In fact, yeah, let's talk about that. We're rebuilding a few things right now. 
What are you rebuilding? Oh yeah, we're uh, we're collecting uh, from all over the place the old Land Rovers and the old uh, you know cars of that nature. You have your Land Rover, you have the old Toyotas, and bringing them back to the original form. These are ones that are very very old because they're just so cool. We thought, hey, let's bring them back and maybe put an LT Corvette engine in it, you know, or a Hemi, or do something really cool with that. So that's a lot of fun. And of course, I have my own cars I play with. An extensive car collection. Do you have one? Uh, I have. Well, it goes all the way back from uh, I have 1927, uh, for example, uh, Ford Top Boy. You know, they're tall ones, right? But all custom other than the body, which is original. Everything underneath it is custom and it's really cool. I have a 28 Ford panel truck that I really love. If you go a little further ahead, I have a 49 Rolls and it's like one of these salsa sedans where the chauffeur drives in front in a convertible, real long front end, big headlights, and there's only room in back for three people. That's really a cool car. And I have two James Bond cars. James Bond did not drive a Bentley. He did not drive a, uh, I mean, he drove a Bentley. He didn't drive an Aston Martin or a Toyota. He drove a Bentley. He drove a Bentley Continental R. And he, they wrote about that in Ian Fleming's book. That's what he had him driving. So I went and bought one at a basket job. Took two years to rebuild it to an official 100-point car. Oh, I love that car so much that I bought Eric Clapton's car. He had one like it. There's not a lot of them out there, by the way. And wow. that is just so much fun. And then uh, with American cars, my favorite car of everything that I kind of have with Alexis, we have it like together as a project is this incredible 1957 Chevy Bel Air. It is candy apple red. It's so customized. My dear friend in Angus Mitchell did it for me as a favor. He made that the coolest car in the world. If I own this car in high school, opposed to my Junker 52 Ford that hardly ever ran, okay, I would have owned the high school. It is so cool looking. That's one of my favorites, you know, but I have several others. These are just a few. I have a couple old Ferraris that are unique. Uh, uh, Got to have a 62 uh, Testarossa Roadster which is very, very rare. And I have a 1967 uh, 275 GTB4, which is kind of a rare card too. And then I have other cards along the way there, but these are some of my favorites. What car do I drive every day? It's my everyday car in Austin, Texas. My everyday car, even though Ferraris are in the garage and all that, my everyday car is a Ford, I'm sorry, a Chevy Tahoe. Just a regular oh. Chevy Tahoe, my everyday car. Utility, it's great. But I'll pull the other cars out of the garage every now and then and cruise. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a number of car stories, as I referenced in the beginning. Oh, oh much, oh, and, much. And I, and I want to talk about the 20-year-old Rolls-Royce, the one that you lived in. Oh, boy, yeah. That Tell was, me about that. That was a 1960 uh, Silver Cloud II. Uh, it wasn't in the best of shape, but it still was there. I was trying to rebuild the car, and I kind of went broke. Uh, I went broke because I had a good job. My life wasn't going very good with my wife at the time, so all this money was coming in uh, for this new company called John Paul Mitchell Systems. I was starting with my pal. Uh, anyways, the money never came in. So it was the older of the two cars uh, and the one that was not in the best of shape because I was rebuilding it. So I took it down the hill to get the money. The money never came in. And mm. it ended up being my house for a few weeks. And of course, the rest of the story of how Paul Mitchell started was $700. That's all we had. Lived in my car, figured out a way to make it. And uh, I think the uh, documentary Good Fortune is a good way to tell it. Now, you may want to tell your listening audience it was removed after eight years being on Amazon, everything else, they're putting it back on on a month because in one month because of the popular demand. It's called Good Fortune. Uh, and it's a documentary on how to start not only Paul Mitchell living in a car and not doing very well in life at that time. A little sad, a few bad things were not going on so well. And then uh, it just goes on to how I started Patron nine years later, not knowing a thing about the tequila business. I think it's it's a good example of how to be kind along the way, treat people really kind and how to make it in life with little to nothing. Well, in fact, Alexis, uh, who's been on this program, told us that she used to visit you while you were in the car in yep. the driveway. That's right. <laughs> she, she's a sweetheart. She's like one of the greatest young ladies on the planet. She her is. sister's really cool too. And so is her brothers. Yeah. You um you used to be uh, you started off uh, a door-to-door salesman uh selling uh, cards. Colliers, not not colliers and sacrifices. Door to door. Right. Yep, commission only, no leads. Good With trade. Your brother. Program. Right, you and your brother would do that. 
Yeah, well, my brother and I did newspapers. Encyclopedias was just me. Okay. Did it ever occur to you that at the time that you were selling the books that you would become an entry in the encyclopedia? Nope. <laughs> not, not a clue. In fact, when I graduated, go back a little further from high school, I liked cars so much that my ideal job would have been, because I had no money for college, my ideal job would have been to have a car that or a truck I could just drive all day long and maybe make $150 a, a week. You know, that would be wonderful. I could get by okay and I could drive. I just love driving. The little bit I know that things would obviously, would, the American dream came true for me is what happened. America does work. Forget what these stupid politicians are doing in Washington, D.C. Forgive them. They're stupid. I don't know what their agenda is, but it's dumb, okay? America is good. America is a great country. Maybe Washington people are doing things that are stupid, that are hurting our country, that are dividing people. But look the other way. Be kind to one another. That's politicians putting you against one another. Love and be kind to one another. And then the American dream works. If you're sad and angry and bl blame everybody else and bitch about everything, it's never going to work. Be kind. If you have an enemy, be kind to them. You blow them away. Be kind to somebody you haven't been along with. You'll be amazed how... First of all, they're blown away. Why are they kind to me? I've been mean to them. And they change in most cases. Right. Well, you had an opportunity to to um, certainly, I don't know, maybe not express a level of kindness given the situation that had happened to you through the years. Let's go back to meeting John Capra and the intro to Red Oh, Camp sure. And oh, all yes. Tell the story about how you got into the into the salon business and the hair business. You how it really it. didn't work. Now, that's a very interesting story to do. First of all, John Capra has been my friend for over 50 years, one of the most beautiful friendships, one of the most beautiful human beings on the planet, along with his wife, Doris. So anyways, I was working. I used to have pretty good jobs. I'm 26 years old. I'm working for Time, Inc. I'm circulation manager of Time, for, Time Sports Illustrated, Fortune, and Look Magazine or Life Magazine, I'm sorry, okay? And what basically meant I ran a big boiler room with 50 people on the phone getting people to resubscribe. So I thought, well, you know, I'd love to be a vice president. So I walked up to my vice president. I said, excuse me, but what do I have to do to become a vice president? He said, you have no college. I said, well, that's true. I said, but I'm good at what I do. He says, yes, and you're only 26 years old. Come back and ask me when I'm 20, when you're 35. I said, that's it. So I went to see a job uh, they call them placement counselors at the time. And that's when I met John uh, Capra. He was a counselor. And I said, I'm really looking for a job right now. I want to excel at different things to do. I'm dead in the water here. So John got me one job. If it didn't work out, he got me another one. At one time, because I could do pretty well in sales, he had two jobs at one time so I could save a little bit of money. Unbelievable. And then one day he says, you know, here's an opportunity. You're going to have to take a cut and pay. Uh, and, you know, now, this is going back to, uh, you know, many, many years ago. This is 1975. Uh, I'm sorry. No, 1971. You're going to take a cut and pay. He says, but it's in the beauty industry, professional beauty industry. Even though you're going to make less money, there's no end in sight to what you can make. They don't have some really super sharp people in their JP. I think you'll do very well. I said, how big of a cut and pay? They said, well, your base salary now is $850 plus a little commission. You're going to go down to $650 and a car allowance of $125. I thought, what the heck? Let's give it a try. It's only me. I'm single at this point. Let's go for it. And I did. And I worked for this company for several years and within a year and a half i made it up to their national manager of two divisions of the company they fired me after four and a half years they okay. fired me because i complained about them animal testing i said you shouldn't test on animals you don't have to we only make hair care products for humans test on us why are you doing it they said well we're redkin the scientific approach and we've got to have it there as our scientific approach but it does nothing they said jp you're a manager now a national manager play along with the corporation. Anyways, I go away. I come back two weeks later. Guys, this is wrong. Yes, it makes you look good, but look at these poor little marmoset monkeys. They stay in a cage all day long. They never go outside. It's just not right. How about the quality of our product is what speaks, not the scientific hoopla we put on. And Paula Kent was a very nice lady, by the way. She said, JP, love you dearly. We all do. But man, you are messing up management right now. We have to let you go, JP. You can keep your secretaries for a few weeks. We'll give you a nice separate pay, but go on and do something else. And I did. And I worked for this other 
company. It was a small beauty company called Troy. And in one year, I believe I tripled their sales. They came to me and said, JP, we're going to fire you. I said, why? They said, because we found this guy named David Chapman that could do your job for one third the money. I said, but you're only paying me $3,000 a month and 6% on all new sales. They say, that's why we have to let you go because your sales are so big. You're making more money than Joe, who's the owner of the company. (laughs) He was also a small one. I said, you're kidding. Anyways, long story short, I left, went to work for a company, Syntex Spot, called Firmadel. And this is a great story. In one year, and I was there to train their whole sales force and upper management and selling and selling techniques. In one year, they went from $8 million to $12 million. They fired me after one year because I just wasn't one of them. I didn't hang out on the weekends. I didn't do every single thing that was unreasonable that Mr. Neil Wallach asked me to do, who there was a guy in charge, right? No way. They said, we're gonna listen, you're not one of us. We're gonna fire you. I said, but look at all the sales growth. You're fired. They're really, he was mean about it. Anyways, no problem. It was destiny for me, right? So these are three different jobs I had, but why is it leading to this? I thought with my friend, Paul Mitchell, great hairdresser, Paul, let's start our own company. I'll raise the money. So I went out to raise $600,000, $500,000. That's what I needed. So we had the money. We had the money and we, I quit everything I did. Even my relationship left the better car there, took the older Rolls Royce down the hill. <laughs> and it was a Porsche I left, a nice running Porsche, left her all the money for my daughter and her to last a while, went down the hill, no money, zero. But here's what I want to drive at. That was zero money. It was difficult. We made it. Two years later, when we were able to pay our bills on time, and by the way, that's when we were successful. People say, when were you successful with Paul Mitchell? Two years. Why? Because we paid our bills on time the first time. We didn't pay them all, <laughs> but we paid them on time and had $2,000 each. Shortly after that, an epiphany came to me. And this is a good thing for all your listeners. Believe in faith. I did a darn good job at Reckon. They fired me. Mm-hmm. I did a darn good job at Try at Fermadel. They fired me. If I didn't work, for all three companies. I learned something different in each one. I could have never started John Paul Mitchell Systems on $700, let alone $500,000. Each company taught me a different segment of the industry. It's as if a power much greater than I, much greater than I said, oh, you're gonna move on. Nope, you're gonna move on, you're gonna move on. This is what you're destined to do. Human beings out there, every one of you, you're destined to do something good. Be open to positivity, be open to good things happening your way. If you're open to bad things happening in your life or happening around you or gossiping, that's what your life will be all about. You'll yeah. never have that opportunity. Be positive, be happy, the world's for you. Leave it open to you. Successful people do all the things that unsuccessful people don't want to do. That's correct, sir. That is well, that's my motto. <laughs> and I know it is. There is definitely failure. So working with Paul Mitchell then <laughs> and selling things out of the back of a of a car again. Yeah, door to door. <laughs> door to door again. Inventory. We're back to a car <laughs> story. Right. Exactly. You then start to build up the business. What what did you when when was the turning point? Well, that turning point was two years after we started business where we could actually pay our bills on time and have $2,000 left over. That was the turning point. It's like, my God, we haven't made. To a lot of people, that's nothing. To us, it was all the world. We haven't made. Our dream, I'd love to share with you, our dream was if we could only build a company up over the years to do $5 million a year total in business, we would end up with about $250,000 each. Oh my God, we're set for life. That was our dream. Little did we know, we'd be able to get into, you know, 100 million, 200 just, and just go beyond. We, we didn't know that. We learned along the way. So as you are growing a company, a business or a happiness or a family, learn along the way how to be better and do things on a bigger scale. Yeah, wonderful. What's the salon business taught you? It has taught me that some of the kindest, most wonderful, nicest people on the planet are hairstylists. And a hairstylist will never, ever really lose their job. In fact, there's a shortage of hairstylists now. One of my granddaughters, wonderful Katie May, sweetest girl in the world, I'm putting her through college. One day she says, Grandpa, this is really, really great, but I want to be a hairdresser. I said, honey, you're almost finished with college, but Grandpa, I want to be a hairdresser. I love the fun of being a hairdresser. 
Can't I just switch now, be a hairdresser and go to a Paul Mitchell school? I said, honey, I know it's taught in a Paul Mitchell school. Heck yes. If you change your mind, you can finish your last year of college. Yes, go ahead. There's so many people in this industry that are having fun at what they're doing. They have a new experience every day. So that makes me happy being around them. It makes me very, very happy. You, you give a lot back to the hair industry as well. I know you, you're always up for teaching, stopping in, going to the schools. And, yes, and, and I've got to imagine that that kind of experience and, and the continued giving back again is completely fulfilling for you to go back oh, into the place that started in the trunk of the car. Believe me to tell you, it is so, so fulfilling during COVID. A lot of salons had to shut down for months because of the dumb rules Putin put out. We're right. not the truth. We were lied to, unfortunately, by Fauci, the president, whatever. They lied, okay? Anyways, and I don't mind saying that at all because the proof just came out. They didn't tell us the truth. It's not one shot. You get one or two shots, you'll never catch. You can never give it to anybody else. They lied. But anyways, they closed down salons, all kinds of stuff. They closed these things down, right? And these people are out of business. They have no money. Many of them work week to week or month to month. So when that happened, we instantly turned down all government funding, which we qualified for and said, letters to Washington, give it to hairdressers. They need it more. When we we finally came out of it and they opened up the salons. Many salons didn't have the money for inventory. So with my partner, Angus, we talked about it a little bit. We said, what the heck? Look what they've given us in life. Let's give back. So we took $4 million and maybe just a little more than that and gave it back to the hairdressers. We gave them free. All the salons that supported Paul Mitchell, if you supported Paul Mitchell, we had the whole list. You're a big supporter of us. We gave them free. Back bar products, styling product, everything they needed, shampoos, conditioners to open their doors and go back into business again. So we knew now they have the supplies to go back into business again. And with our distributors, we gave them special dating so they could give the salon special dating on whatever other products they got. Did that make me feel good? That was the best multi-millions I ever contributed to somebody because it was wonderful. It helped their lives out. I felt like a million, billion, zillion dollars doing that. So yeah. things like this happen along the way that make people feel good. Before we get back to this interview, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. If you want to hear great conversations and Greg Eulen going deep with guests on everything from used car acquisitions to finding your niche and selling to it, I recommend adding Connected to your podcast rotation. Now let's get back to my interview. Tell the story about getting into tequila. Why tequila? <laughs> I'm sitting back in 1988, the end of 88, beginning of 89. I just finished a race uh, with my partner, Paul, crossing Australia in a solar energy car that we built. It was really fun. <laughs> I get back, I'm starting to look at building this house for my family, kind of a holiday house on the West Coast. And my builder said, you got to meet this guy named Mark Crowley. He's a good fellow. He lost his money. He's going bankrupt in the hospitality business. But he's a really good architect and designer. I met Martin and said, let's start a business. Niche. Martin goes to Mexico. He buys pavers. He buys building supplies, brings them back to architects for their model homes or sells it to restaurants at a very low price from Mexico, furniture, all these things. After one year, we're doing okay, but not so good. So we're sitting at my house at that time and we're sipping tequila. We were going to make margaritas. So, well, let's have a shot first. And it was one of those that you kind of hold your breath on. I said, Martin, next time you go down there, find out because you're on your way down to buy some stuff for this place we're going to be building. Now we're in early 1989. Martin, go down there and uh, see what they drink, bring back a couple of bottles. And Martin did. They were just nondescript bottles, and it was smoothest as anything I've ever tasted. In fact, it was the smoothest. He says, but JP, I met this guy named Francisco Alcaraz that can make it smoother. I said, show me. He brought back a bottle. I said, that's it. I don't know anything about this business. You don't either. So I'm going to buy 1,000 cases, which is 12,000 bottles with this guy's formula. And Martin found these bottles made out of recycled glass. That was the same bottles we they use today at Patron. And then we used so recycled the uh, uh, uh uh, paper in order for the packaging and everything else. So I thought this fits into my category. We came back to the United States with it. Nobody wanted to buy it because mm. it was $37 and 95 cents a bottle retail. It costs a lot to make. In those days, the average tequila was about $5. The expensive one was close to $15. So they said it's the best in the world. No one would take us on. 
Finally, we find a person that only sold wine. We talked him into it. I said, if we could get you Spago's Restaurant, which was the number one restaurant in Southern California, and Ba Cantina, if we get you them as customers, would you take it? Even with 2,000, 1,000 cases, anything. You could be our exclusive distributor. We'll hold you sales meetings. They said, okay. But I knew we had it because Wolfgang tasted it and said, I'll take it. He was a friend of mine. He said, JP, this is great. I want to serve it to my celebrity friends. Baja Cantina, same thing with Martin. So we had it. After one year, they only sold a 1,000 cases. We had to let them go. We took on Jim Beam. Jim Beam, a big distributor, we would put them in the middle. So we had a middleman. They would sell to the big distributors. They would sell to the retailers and the clubs and the restaurants. And we thought, whoa, Jim Beam, this is good. After a couple of years, they came to us and said, guys, I know we're only doing 12,000 cases a year now, but I got to tell you, the most you'll ever do is 20,000 cases. You have the best tequila in the world, but it's too expensive. Now it's at $39.95 a gallon. I mean, a bottle from 37. It's just too expensive, guys. So we dropped them. We took on Seagram's. Seagram's took it to 70,000 cases a year. We were happy, but we knew we could do better. So we went to court with Seagram's and paid them. We paid them money, which they justified, but should have got received. We paid it to them. We paid them a lot of money, even took out a loan to pay the money and took it over ourselves. Well, that little company that was never supposed to do 20,000 cases a year maximum uh, when I sold Patron about, oh, five years and six months ago, uh, I think with Patron alone, we were doing about 3,500,000 cases plus the other brands we had, the Another. biggest ever in the history. So with that in mind, I realized that number one, this is a wonderful area to be in. And of course I had a five-year non-compete, which was just up this last April. That's why I joined my girls. So I started Bandero before I left Patron, but they said, you could keep it JP, but you can't, you have to give it to anybody or sell it to somebody. You cannot compete or even do anything with it for five years, which I did. I would, I, I would do that if they didn't even ask me to do it in writing, just out of respect for the money they gave me. And hence back in the Kila business. Now, again, my daughter, took it over with my son and then I got back in again just in the last couple of months and I could just say this Patron is one of the greatest brands in the world and I'm building definitely another great brand so I'll have two of the world's greatest brands did Clint Eastwood or Tom Cruise and Vanilla Sky help uh, the oh Clint the I'm glad you mentioned Clint and he, oh my god and even share Clint oh if you got time for a quick story yeah, of course hey Clint calls me up this is Patron's a couple years old. I just meet my wife, Eloise, who's my wife now. And Clint calls me on the phone one day and says, JP, are you still going out with that uh, Eloise you introduced me to? I said, yeah, Clint. That I love this girl I'm going to get married to her. He goes, well, here's a way to impress her. I have a new movie coming out where I'm a Secret Service agent in the line of fire. I want you to go to the premiere. So he gave me two tickets to the premiere. So I go down to the premiere and Clint's nowhere in sight. He's someplace else promoting the movie. But his producer found me, gave me a seat in the middle of the theater next to him, free popcorn. I'll never forget free Pepsi because it's normally Coca-Cola. Free And I said, aha. So I take Eloise in. We sit right in the middle next to the producer over here, free popcorn. I mean, but that wasn't the gift. We're watching the movie. The only thing that he drank in the movie was Patron tequila and the yeah. touching point with him the terrorist on the phone he's trying to talk this guy out of as a secret service agent of killing the president bottle of patrol in front of him sipping it while he's trying to talk the guy out of it i mean it was priceless and i think a year later when playboy was a real classy magazine he they did an interview with him he says i'll for two things good red wine and patrol tequila i mean he oh. just but he loved it. But he is a, by the way, he is a good man. If you guys want to know what he's like, because I spent some time with him personally, he is a wonderful man. I was with him when his daughter took her first couple of steps. Anyways, he's the most wonderful human beings on this planet. He's just great. Anyways, and then Cher. Cher was doing a movie called Burlesque, and they said, you got to carry around this bottle. And then one of the handmaids said, she said, well, my friend JP has Patron. Why don't we just make it Patron? And she's not drinking it, but she was carrying it on the tray. So a lot of people did this. And then the rap, rap industry got involved with Patron. They loved it. We didn't pay them money to do it. They loved it and started making songs about Patron. And all we do is just thank them and praise them. What a wonderful <laughs> So put it this way, when you do good things for others and help others out and leave yourself, leave yourself open to the universe, good things come your way. They really do. Well, and I, I just mentioned it, but Tom Cruise ordered it by name in Vanilla Sky. I mean, well, uh, God bless you. God bless you, Tom Cruise. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
Um, what has the tequila business taught you? It has taught me that if you go into a business and you teach people how to do something responsibly, especially with alcohol, it works. When I'm telling people, you don't have to pour it in margaritas until you know you you feel a buzz. You could drink it straight, but you sip it. You don't gulp it. You just sip and drink it straight. So maybe a couple of drinks could last you the same time five margaritas last you. And whereas people would be responsible, but also taught me something else. People that are drinking now want to treat themselves to the best. And I thought, wow, I guess it's the same in all industries. Like Paul Mitchell, people bought it because they want to treat themselves to the best hair care. Salon said also, Patron, they went for it regardless of the price because it was the best and they knew it. People want to treat themselves. And that taught me something really. Plus, it's a fun industry. It is so much fun. Blast, right. But it's a little bit about the Patron Express train car, too. Sure. Oh, yes. Oh, a fun thing. When, when I married my wife in 1963, my dear friend Isaac Tigrit had found the old train car that his grand uncle had uh, built back in 1927, and he rebuilt it completely. When I married her, he gave it to me as a gift for a couple of weeks, as a Christmas gift to take anywhere I wanted. Oh, my God. And Wolfgang Puck gave me a sous chef to bring on the train with me. Dan Aykroyd, a case of the best Bordeaux. It was it was like, you know, a dream come true. Anyways, several years later, uh, my dear friend Isaac Tigret ran into financial challenges, which I gave him a helping hand with. And then one day he came up to me and said, JP, I could give you back about 400000 of the million that I owe you because things are not going right for me right now. I've got a million bucks. I could give you 400000 but I really need the other 600000 But I'd like you to give you the train of security. I'll pay you back in a few years. I said, sure, Martin, you bet. I'll do it, okay? So he gave me the train at that time as the, shall we say, the steward of the train. And I did. And I kept it. I took care of it. I drove it. It was beautiful. And then a few years later, he came back and said, JP, chances are I'm not going to repay you, but I cannot think of a better place for the train to land. This was 1996. JP, the train is yours. I said, Isaac, you can take it whenever you want, or your beautiful daughter, Augusta, take it all. So when they want to take it, please, it's yours, right? So I kept it all these years. I kept it in mint condition, and I called it, instead of a car 50, the Patron Express. So at Patron Tequila, we used it nationally for philanthropy and for fun things to do. And that's what we did. went all across the country, back and forth, back and forth. We did philanthropic things on it, raising money. We did fun things for our account and our distributors. About a year ago, Augusta came to me and said, JP, out of all the wonderful things my dad did, he started Hard Rock Cafes. He started the House of Blues. All these wonderful things had a little bit of bad luck. That's the only thing I could probably get my hands on. JP, can I please buy it from you, whatever the price is, to get it back in the family? Well, that train, the way it was done, was worth several million dollars. Mm -hmm. And I said, Augusta, and it took me two seconds to come up with this one. I said, Augusta, that's where it belongs, but I'm not going to sell it to you for millions of dollars. Your dad only owed me $600,000. So here's the deal, but you got to stick by this deal. You said I could use it whatever I want. Here's the deal. Number one, if I ever use it, I pay for the use of that whole train. Whatever it costs, Amtrak, I, I pay for the full use. It does cost you one time. It's number one. Number two is this. Augusta, that $600,000 you have forever to pay me back. You pay me back whenever you can. It doesn't have to be a year, six months, 10 years. You do it whenever you can, honey. You're doing something so special. It take you 100 years. I really don't care. It's meant to be here. And I so proudly turned the whole thing over to her. Well, my surprise, a week later, I got a check for $600,000. <laughs> what the heck? Well, her life was going really good, and she was married to a really great guy, and they just wrote the check here. They had a lot of money. <laughs> I don't even know quite how much they had. So it ended up in the right spot, and all those decades we used it for Patron. So many people had so much fun off of it, and it was just a great surprise. Out of the ordinary, but wonderful. I wonder if Bandero needs a train next. Well, I was kind of looking at something. That I, say right <laughs> I bet you were. I like, oh, my God. Okay, Jason. Uh, I'll go back on your show again when I tell you what it is. We're working out the logistics on it now. <laughs> deal. So you, ha you have a deal. You have a okay. deal. Um, I want to talk about a couple of other things. Uh, you have, as you have said, done some wrongs in the past and have gone back to make amends with those people. Yeah. One story that I love 
John Paul, is that you got a car fixed and couldn't pay yeah. and drove off. Yeah. Tell us about that story. Magic. Here I am. I have a two and a half year old son. Okay. This is the first time I was homeless in my early 20s, by the way. Yeah. And I ran out of money. And this little car I had was like a little Fiat, right? Was broken, had to be fixed. It was a bill on it for fixing it from this really nice man for about $120. So, and I didn't have the money, but I needed the car. So a friend drove me there, let me and my son out and took off. And I went over there to see the guy. I said, God, it looks good, but how does it run? Is it running good? He goes, yes. I said, can I take it around the block? He goes, of course. So I jumped in the car with my son, and I never came back. Mm -hmm. Now, this is back in the 1960s, okay? And I never, ever came back. Well, when I started making money in the 1980s, and I made enough to pay people back, now we're, let's say, 1983, 84, when I started making finally enough money, I found every person I ever did a mis injustice to, everyone I thought I may have ripped off, and I ran across him because I that was a ripoff. And I went to the old location that was a body and fender place. I mean, I'm sorry, it was a mechanic place that turned into a body and fender place. I said, excuse me, I introduced myself. I said, going back about, you know, four some odd years, however long it was, there was a, a, a gentleman here that was fixing cars, uh, you know, as he specialized in foreign cars. Any idea of whatever happened to that man? Because he must be up there in age now. He goes, boy, is this your lucky day? He's my landlord. He's the landlord. He got out of business you know, 30 years. The landlord, he's here. So he's I, here. Him, I said, excuse me, sir. I said, my name is John Paul Lee Jerry. He goes, well, nice to meet you. I said, sir, I want to tell you a story going back several decades. I said, if we go back several decades, sir, there was a young man in here once with a young boy and you had fixed a Fiat and they wanted to take it for a drive and they never come back. He goes, I remember, I remember. I could not figure out why. There was a nice boy. He was such a nice man. I said, sir, I'm that nice man, okay? I was down and out. I needed it so badly. And I'm just in search now to make everything right. So I handed him 10 times the amount of money, which was about uh, $1,200. I just handed it to him in cash. I said, here, this is yours. It should take care of the says, No, I can't take it. You made my day. He started crying. He was so happy. I said, no, sir, you would make my day if you took it. If you didn't take it, you would make my day. Make my day too, please, first. We hugged each other. We talked for a while and just talked about how wonderful life is. And uh, it, boy, I could have walked on water after that. And I'm not saying I'm Jesus or anywhere close, but I mean, I felt like, wow, you know, this is really cool in life. That was a beautiful experience for me. And the only one I regret was one fellow I searched for for years. And I even had private investigators, even part of the government did it for me as kind of a favor because they were able to, without violating any laws, try and find this guy. I didn't find him till eight years after he died. This was about four years ago I finally found him. And when I found him, unfortunately, he was married, had a couple of children, and it was eight years prior that he died. I mean, I want to say, Michael Davenport, I'm so sorry for everything that's happened between you and I. We were the best of friends. I was in the wrong. You were not. I'm deeply sorry. I want to buy you a car. What would you like? It's your choice, right? That was my only regret. I didn't get Tim enough and quick enough but I got to everybody else that I ever did anything wrong to, and I made it right one way or another. Well, goosebumps on the radio here. So the, so the thing for the goosebumps and your audience is this. If there's anyone you wanted to say, I'm sorry for doing this to you, or I regret doing this, first forgive yourself and forgive them, but tell them now, if there's anyone you truly love, tell them now, I love you so much because you never know when it's going to be too late. Go ahead and do it. Peace. In 2011, John Paul, you signed the Giving Pledge. Yes. You a fraternity of uh, very well-known billionaires committed to donating at least half their fortunes. That's tell me, correct. Tell me a little bit about your decision around that. You bet. As in life, I started making money to be able to pay my bills on time. And that was a big thing for me. I could pay my bills on time, right? And I started making money and I made so much money. It was like, wow, I love contributing to various causes. Like I'm probably one of the biggest contributors to homelessness. I built, helped build communities for the medical centers. I mean, really big time because I was there, you know, I know it. So I got a phone call from uh, Warren Buffett. 
and says, John Paul, I got over your number. I've heard that you just giving for years to all these causes and just giving, 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 trying to help them out. And, you know, you're, you're doing very well in life right now. And my God, this is wonderful. Uh, Bill Gates and I want to invite you a small dinner. There'll be 12 of us there. It'll be in Dallas, just north of your town. Please come up. I thought, oh, what the heck? I never met Warren before, never met Bill. So we came on up to listen to what they were doing. And what they were doing was what I was already doing, giving to people with an end result. We don't give the money away. We don't say, here, here's a giveaway. We don't give people hands out. We give them a hand up. Whatever we do must have long-term results is what we look at. And that's how we do it. I said, guys, this is so easy for me to do because what the pledge is, is this. We pledge during our lifetime or after we die or a combination of the two. We'll take half our wealth and give it back to make the world a better place to live. Most of us are doing it now while we're alive and a big hunk after we die. We're doing both, most of us, right? It was perfect. So once a year we go to meetings and in the meetings, we don't try to hustle anybody for our charities or anything else. It's just a group of billionaires that get together. Most everyone's a billionaire. There's a couple in there that aren't quite billionaires, but they will be. I think there's about 170 of us right now, mostly Americans. So for those people out there that say that 1%, take their money, take their money, give it to us, spread it out. Bad words, bad words, okay? Know that there's over 170 of us that made it, but know about what it's like not to make it. And we are giving so much. I mean, I'm giving millions away. Not only my companies, but my own little family foundation gives away millions every year. We're giving back to help people get a hand up. We're not only helping people that are homeless, like Community First, which is in Austin, Texas, as part of Mobile Oats and Fishes. We're creating things. We created Woodshop metal shop, auto shop, even an entrepreneur center. And they're saying we're homes. 2,000 homes will be created. We have 500 now for homeless people to give them a chance. And you're saying, well, why are you doing all these shops? They're homeless. They don't want to work. Uh, uh, uh. I may have put a million and a half dollars into an entrepreneur center there for them. But in the first 18 months, homeless people, they learn crafts, jewelry, painting, art, ceramics, and some are artists to begin with. In the first 18 months, they sold almost $200,000 worth of crafts. Mm. They Homeless people, they get to keep all the money. And some of it to get betterness. One lady, for the first time in her life, she's 65 years old, bought her first car. It was a used car, but a darn good one. Her first car in her whole life. So it's helping the able that a lot of them are able, had a, a bad break. Maybe they ended up in a wheelchair, had a bad break. But we're helping all become more able. Now, when you do that, you're contributing to, let's say, the universal force and God's work. You're contributing to making other people better. I just did a film that I was the executive producer on. It's a runaway success. It's been out there now since the 4th of July, all about child trafficking. Unfortunately, babies like you know, six, seven, eight-year-old kids being trafficked for sex. It's one of the most successful movies ever. It's already done over $200,000 at the box office. Some mm -hmm. theaters didn't want it. No, it's too controversial. Don't show that. We don't want people to see that but it's true. We want to show you how we busted an entire ring. It's true. It's all over the United States and the world. And there's a lot of politicians and a lot of high priced people out there that are involved in this stupid thing, buying God's children. God's children aren't for sale. This movie exposes it all. So all of a sudden, people would tell people they'd buy tickets for other people to come and see it. They couldn't afford to see it. And it was just revolutionary. And it's just now coming out of the theaters. It'll go to streaming. And now it's going to go to at least 23 countries in the world. So Congratulations. people to do wow. things like this to make people better off. And when I invested the money, I gave them the money to start off with this. Hey, here's the first million bucks. Go for it. I didn't do it to get any money back. I got it to get a message out. We had no idea we'd make money off it. Not a clue. Every dime I make off of it is to go back to something to save children. Every dime. One final story about when you were a child. I want you to tell the story of your mother yep. and the Salvation Army kettle and the dimes. So proud of mama. It's got me started. We had a deadbeat dad. My mom was an immigrant. She came over on the boat from Greece and, uh, 
we didn't have any money. My father at that time was in the military. Uh, and this is the 1940s, but a deadbeat dad. Uh, so I didn't have a father before I was two years old. Uh, they divorced and uh, it was just my mom, my brother and I. Uh, and my mom was one of the wonderful ladies on the planet. And even though from five years old to nine years old, I was in a foster home during the week because she was sick. She had to work and was sick. She couldn't take care of us. So we would see her every weekend. Well, at Christmas time, we were always with her. She took us to downtown Los Angeles. Angeles. We leave in Echo Park. And by trolley car, it was five cents for the trolley car. We trolley cars then. They got rid of all the tracks. Anyways, we went downtown and we went to this one corner near 7th and Broadway, where within a block, they had a May Company's, a Bullock's, so every major department store. LA downtown was different in those days. It was the place to go. Trains going around in circles, puppets. Oh, my brother and I thought we were the luckiest kids in the world. We got to see all this. Mom gave us a dime. We're little kids. She says, boys, you share this dime in your little fingers. Go there and put in the bucket with the fellow ringing the bell. So we did. And then we went back and said, mom, now, by the way, this is 1950, 1951. We said, mom, why do we give them a dime? Because in those days, it was two soda pops or three candy bars. <laughs> why do we do that, mom? You know, that's a big deal for us kids, right? They said, boys, and we didn't have much money. She said, that's the Salvation Army. And there are people that don't have a place to live or food to eat, and they take care of them. She says, son, we don't have a lot, but we gave something. Always remember in life, there are people that have less than you do. Whether the circumstances are true or not, they're still there. We've got to do something. We could do a dime, but we did something this year, son. Never forget that. And wow. it's with me. It's stuck with me. Great John Paul, you are an inspiration in many ways. We could fill multiple shows just talking to you. And we will have you back on when you oh, make I'd it. I'd love to talk to you. We're just getting going. We're just getting going. We're just getting going. Thank you. Thank you, for being, thank you for being on Cars and Culture. Keep loving thank you. to your group. Thank you so much. I really appreciate I'll it. I'll get you that bottle of Bandero. Let us have your address. Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you so you. much. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to thank my guest again today, American entrepreneur John Paul DeJoria. And to see my interview with him, go to the Carson Culture YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to see more than 120 interviews and nearly a thousand videos. I'm Jason Stein. We'll see you down the road.